Uh, so yeah, th thanks Ben so much for the introduction um, and yeah, uh, for the invitation to to be here today. I'm I'm really uh, delighted to be sharing some of my work with you on um, particularly on trying to understand um, disturbance impacts and uh, responses and recovery in terrestrial ecosystems using uh, ecoacoustics. Um, and so yeah, I'm based. I'm a postdoc, as Ben said. I'm based in the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University, which is in uh, uh, usually sunny Okinawa, Japan. Uh, it's a kind of small subtropical island uh, way to the south uh, in the Ryukyu Archipelago. I'll point it out on a map a bit later on. Um, so I'm going to be talking a, a little bit today about um, ecological stability. So this is my kind of um, core interest, the thing that kind of drives me in my research uh, overall. So what, uh, so to kind of set things up then, I, I'm going to introduce stability as, as the central framework for understanding how ecosystems respond to environmental change. And the concept is um, complex and multidimensional. There's lots of different ways of measuring stability. So you can have some kind of um, ecological variable, maybe it's a particular, um, maybe it's the abundance of a species of interest or biomass or something, or it could be some ecosystem function, or in the acoustic space, it could be something like an acoustic index or um, the detections of a particular species. Then we can think about stability in lots of different ways. We can use, for instance, the uh, variability of that uh, value through time. So we can just measure uh, when a, with a time series, we measure, say, the, the coefficient of variation or something. Or if we have some known um, disturbance event, some perturbation, we can also measure things like the um, resistance to that uh, disturbance or the uh, recovery uh, uh, afterwards or the resilience and so on. So there's lots of different uh, ways of measuring stability. Um, and so I'm interested in stability because it tells us how um, ecosystems respond to uh, human activities and disturbance. And so I, I really like this quote that says, uh, disturbances and stability are multidimensional, but our understanding of them is not. And so that's really the inspiration behind a lot of my work is trying to get a more uh, kind of well-rounded understanding of this uh, sometimes nebulous concept of stability. And so to get this um, more multidimensional understanding of stability, we need to integrate different methods uh, and think about uh, ecological questions at different scales. So my research mixes um, some kind of theory and, and syntheses on in various um, um, areas with uh, uh, aquatic mesocosm experiments and also um, uh, some acoustic monitoring to think about uh, ecosystems at larger scales, and we do that in uh, terrestrial uh, ecosystems here in Okinawa mainly. And so today I, I'm only going to be talking about this um, acoustic monitoring um, um, part of my research. So um, if we're thinking about stability in natural, real-world, complex ecosystems, uh, how can we measure uh, stability in nature? We need uh, really high resolution uh, biodiversity data. Uh, and, and one promising tool for getting that data is to use uh, passive acoustic monitoring. So um, I'm sure almost everybody here is, is well familiar with the concept of the, the soundscape, but I'll introduce it anyway. So if we think about the, the soundscape as being the set of all observable sounds in an ecosystem, we can break it down into maybe three or so uh, main components. So we have um, biophony, which is the set, uh, which is all um, vocalizing animals such as birds. Let me just check that I'm sharing my sound. I am now. Um, so such as birds. Then we have geophony, which is all natural but non-biological sounds, things like wind and rain. And we also have uh, anthropophony, which is the human aspect of the soundscape. So lots of uh, sounds related to human activities, including uh, kind of machine sounds and, and, and transport like this aeroplane.
And so um, Ben was asking me just, just before we started about um, the kind of link between uh, kind of cultural values and soundscapes. And so, so more broadly, not, not just thinking about uh, here in Japan, um, natural soundscapes are, are really important because they provide mental health benefits and, and they connect people with nature. So for example, during the, the um, coronavirus lockdowns, people were um, you know, really valuing the, the little time that they could spend outside. And they were, uh, one of the things people were remarking on was the, um, yeah, the, um, their experience of the soundscape uh, wherever they were um, um, locked down. Uh, and they're also very culturally important. So um, uh, soundscapes are on our national heritage in Japan. So in uh, 1986, Japan's Ministry for the Environment listed uh, 100 sounds and soundscapes as being uh, a type of cultural heritage uh, here in Japan. Uh, and, and so um, because of all these reasons, variable or, or unstable soundscapes matter. So we want uh, a soundscape to be um, consistent in the delivery of these uh, important benefits for human culture and health. Um, but before I go any further, I want to, to thank the local people, both historic and present, where I conduct my work. Most of this research is done here in Okinawa. Um, so I want to thank the uh, Ryukyuan people uh, here. So uh, Okinawa is, um, is here. This is uh, all the kind of Ryukyu archipelago here. Um, so this is uh, mainland Japan I'm here, here's Tokyo. Um, and so Ryukyu is, uh, sorry, Okinawa is a, a subtropical island that is uh, way to the south of, of mainland Japan. Um, and, and people um, often ask me, well, you know, why Okinawa? Well, first thing is there's a, a very conveniently located uh, research institute uh, where I'm currently sitting uh, with, with world-class facilities and a range of um, uh, different topics. Um, but Personally, when you come from rainy England, uh, Okinawa is often a pretty nice place to be. Uh, it's a good place to be out and, and conducting uh, field research. Um, and it's got some interesting biodiversity. There's plenty of um, birds and insects and uh, reptiles and amphibians, and even um, some pretty cute uh, mega bats that eat uh, fruit. So this is the Ryukyu flying fox. Um, so yeah, we've got good research facilities, rich biodiversity, but perhaps most importantly for the kinds of questions that I'm interested in, uh, Okinawa has this really strong uh, rural to urban gradient, this kind of land use development gradient. So there's about uh, 1.4 million people living in Okinawa, uh, and they live mainly in the south in these kind of blue urban areas here. Uh, and so this is the main city down here, um, uh, uh, Naha, and um, Naha has the second highest population density in all of Japan after Tokyo. So it's like really, really densely populated area down there. So, um, uh, so we can ask really interesting ecological questions about things like land use change and human activity uh, and how that affects uh, biodiversity. So here's a fairly typical image of the North. This is a subtropical dipterocarp rainforest. Um, fa fairly closed canopy most of the time. Um, and uh, uh, here's a fairly, also fairly typical image of Naha in the south. Um, so, I mean, this is a, a national park. This is the, um, the Shuri Castle, which actually appears on the uh, 2000 yen banknote here. Uh, and then just beyond the, um, the kind of walls to the castle, you can see there's just dense, uh, urban area right up to the sea at the back there. So uh, it's uh, there's really not much um, um, kind of uh, spare uh, natural land remaining in the south. So um, to talk a little bit about the, the study design, we, we've been using these um, Wildlife Acoustics SM4 recorders uh, at each field site. We've got one recorder. It's been installed since uh, about 2017. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I've been coming to uh, OIST now for um, a fair few years. I mean, clearly since I actually had hair. Um, so uh, we've got plenty of um, data because we've been going for so long. So we, we're using, this is all part of a wider monitoring network called the Okeon Churamori Project, which means a beautiful forest, um, which has been set up by uh, Ebony Konomo and Masashi Yoshimura here at OIST. 
Um, and, and so the project uses um, multiple complementary approaches to monitor Okinawa's ecosystem. So we've got some um, malaise traps for sampling insects. There's also uh, camera traps out uh, and we've got weather stations. Uh, and we uh, also have these acoustic monitors. Uh, and so we've got these 24 field sites across uh, the island of Okinawa. And um, we set up these sites to try and capture Okinawa's full range of different habitat types. So often they are very like locally in like maybe a park or a um, like a small patch of scrubland or something, but the, the surrounding area tends to represent uh, the full range of different conditions possible. So when we look at kind of a larger uh, scale, we, we've pretty much captured every type of habitat, terrestrial habitat there is in Okinawa. Um, so today, as I said, we're focusing just on the acoustic part of, of the Okeon project. Uh, and we do um, uh, not quite continuous recording. We record for 10 minutes out of every half hour. And we've been doing that at these 24 sites. Uh, uh, since about February of 2017, which means that right now we have uh, in total more than 400,000 hours of continuous audio data. So uh, to put that into perspective, if I were to listen to it all back to back, uh, it would take me about 50 continuous years without any breaks. Uh, so obviously that is um, quite a lot of data, um, much too much data to be sorting manually, and I'll, I'll come to that in a second. So um, uh, for anyone unfamiliar with uh, kind of spectrograms, this is what the data looks like when it comes in. We can visualize the data as these spectrograms and, and see uh, we have time along the x-axis. So uh, uh, you can read it as you would read a, a score of music. And uh, higher frequencies, uh, higher pitched sounds tend to occur nearer the, the top up here. And we can get um, ecologically useful information from the soundscape because species signal their presence at a given time and location, and they occupy these um, specific frequencies. They have these kind of acoustic niches. And so um, here are some different birds singing at different times and for different durations and at these different frequencies. You can see their um, characteristic signals in there uh, in, in the soundscape. As I said, we've got lots of, of data. 50 years worth of data is much too much data to sort manually. So um, we use uh, kind of supervised learning to automatically detect species in recording. So this is uh, using off the shelf um, kind of uh, programs. So we're using um, Kaleidoscope Pro for also from Wildlife Acoustics um, to, to first of all, uh, uh, separate different sound types. So how it works is Kaleidoscope Pro, you, you feed the um, training data set in and it uh, uh, identifies what it thinks are distinct clusters of, of particular sounds. And then you, um, you, you go through those and you maybe identify a particular cluster of sounds that you're interested in. Um, and you say, okay, you know, maybe I'm trying to find this one particular species of bird or this one uh, reptile, or maybe I want, uh, you know, rain noise for whatever reason. Um, and so then you um, get the, um, you, you say, okay, we're looking for this, and you get the, the program to search just specifically for that sound. Um, and then uh, it returns what it thinks are that sound, and then you spend a long time correcting the errors, uh, because, uh, yeah, the, um, the the program is usually not that great the first maybe the first five or six times at least and so there's lots of going back and saying okay well maybe you got these ones right but these ones wrong and so on um, and so you do lots of rerunning to weed out those mistakes but once you've trained it and you're happy with it uh, you can apply that uh, a working algorithm to new data and then find that it doesn't work on that either and go back again and start again. But uh, eventually you get to a point where you have got a, an algorithm that is uh, correctly being um, uh, applied to new data and does seem to have a fairly acceptable kind of error rate. And once you've got to there, that's the point where you start uh, actually digging into the results and, and seeing what's there. So um, here are, here's an example of some of those results. So this was our actually our first um, kind of pilot study on um, uh, acoustic monitoring here in Okinawa. Uh, so this is in the journal Ecological Research, which is published by the Ecological Society of Japan. Um, and so um, we can extract information on species dynamics from the soundscape. So using these 
uh, algorithms to train for particular species, we can say, okay, well, let's find all the detections of this species and then interpret the results. So here is a, a figure showing every time this ruddy kingfisher called uh, during a two week period in uh, summer of 2016. So time stops at the center. So you read this a bit like a clock, but it spirals out from the middle. So uh, we've got dates that come uh, further out uh, as you get further away from the, the middle. And the, uh, the time is a 24 hour clock. So we've got midnight at the top here and midday at the bottom. And the size of the bubble just tells us the number of vocalizations that we detected of this species at this particular field site. And so what I, I want you to take away from this is that we can see patterns start to emerge from these data when we uh, use this uh, supervised learning. Um, and so here we see, for example, that this species at this site is calling mainly between about five o'clock and seven o'clock in the morning, classic kind of dawn chorus stuff. Um, and so we did this for um, five different target species with a range of habitat sensitivities across sites for this, this two week period in, uh, I think there's, it was the summer of maybe 2017 or 2016 even, uh, it was like a pilot study as I say. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, the rarity of these species as we increases as we go to the right. So we've got the, the common bulbul and uh, uh, a large billed crow here. Then we've got this um, uh, kingfisher, which is um, uh, kind of migratory and, and found in, in, in uh, kind of spotty uh, areas all over uh, Asia. Then we've got the uh, Ryukyu scopsal, which is um, endemic not to Okinawa, but to the wider Ryukyu archipelago. So it's found on Okinawa and its surrounding islands only. Uh, and then we have um, finally the, the critically endangered Okinawa rail, which is found only in uh, Okinawa's pristine forest to the north of the island. Um, and so uh, looking at patterns in this data, we found that the rarer species uh, were not detected in our more disturbed sites to the south, and that uh, species generally varied in their vocalization densities across these different sites. So um, land cover potentially seems to be having some kind of influence on individual species, certainly in their um, and presence in the soundscape uh, uh, in these in this uh, pilot study, at least. Uh, but of course, remember this is um, acoustic data. It's all uh, kind of inferred observations. So uh, absence of detections does not necessarily mean absence of species. So we can't say for certain uh, that uh, if if um, that there's no uh, you know kingfishers in this site, for instance. Um, and so it's not just uh, individual species we're interested in. Oops, this kind of bioacoustics. We're also interested in um, ecoacoustics. So using um, these acoustic indices to rapidly summarize the soundscape. So um, this uh, appealed to me as being a, a fairly intuitive way of summarizing uh, acoustic data. So um, as a kind of community ecologist, I'm quite used to thinking about ways of summarizing biodiversity with various different indices. And so acoustic indices just try to do the same for the soundscape. So they represent the um, kind of uh, distribution of acoustic energy in the recordings and use that to, to usually try and tell us something about uh, the, the biological signals in the soundscape uh, or other uh, aspects of maybe the, the landscape. So here's an example. Um, comparing the ratio of, so this is the normalized different soundscape index you can use uh, to compare the ratio of biophony, this uh, biological sound, to this anthropophony, this human sound. And we can see the uh, what, what noise pollution looks like on the right there. You see these uh, uh, lower frequency sounds tend to be um, uh, human related sounds. And so they when, when we've got noise pollution in the soundscape, it tends to um, um, mask mainly things in these lower frequencies. And so we can um, quickly summarize this information using uh, acoustic indices, and we can do this at high resolution. So this is now two and a half years worth of data in these 10 minute chunks. And so we can clearly see patterns start to jump out at us when we summarize data this way. So here, the lighter colors are um, uh, biophony, the more biological sounds. Uh, and so we can see um, the dawn chorus, for instance, in the morning and how it um, shifts throughout the seasons. Uh, 
And here in, in Okinawa, we get these uh, really, really bright uh, bands of uh, kind of greenish uh, biotic sound in the summer, uh, which are caused by uh, these really loud cicada choruses. And so uh, as someone growing up in the UK, where we, as far as I know, don't have any cicadas, it was a real shock to me when I first came to Japan and uh, and and stepped outside. I've, it was maybe even the first time I stepped off the airplane and you could already hear them. Because um, I think I came in summer the first time. And uh, uh, yeah, it's just uh, uh, an absolutely deafening uh, uh, sound that I, I had never heard anything like it before. So it really does um, make a huge impact on the soundscape here. Um, but this this idea of of this kind of change in the seasons throughout time, I think is also really interesting, um, not only just from a kind of dynamics perspective, but also in terms of uh, cultural significance. So changing seasons are really, really culturally important in Japan. So a very classic example is uh, the, the Japanese sakura, the cherry blossoms uh, that, that uh, um, bloom in the spring. Uh, and people have been keeping very um, diligent records of, of blooming dates uh, for, for hundreds of years. Um, uh, and so there's lots of kind of um, uh, uh, seasonal um, shifts throughout the year that are celebrated in Japanese culture, like, for example, the, the cherry blossoms, but also these uh, cicada choruses. So these summer soundscapes are, are really dominated by cicada choruses, so much so that a uh, uh, cicada song is considered uh, cultural heritage, and they appear in most depictions of summer in Japanese TV. There's a there's a word um, natsukashi, which is like kind of oh reminiscing like with fond memories, and it's often said about kind of uh, like summers with the cicadas and like hot days and this kind of stuff. Um, so anyway, when when there's depictions of um, uh, uh, summer on on television, even in in Japanese animations, anime, you often hear these. Uh, cicadas. Uh, and I should say other soft drinks are available. Um, so uh, these are very loud, very dominant sounds. Uh, uh, and so these disruptive sounds like, like these, they, they could potentially affect the uh, kinds of information that we get from these soundscapes and, and maybe even our ability to really understand what soundscapes are are kind of composed of or maybe what what biological information there is in there and so this really got us thinking about cicada sounds particularly but also just more broadly um potentially disruptive background sounds and so we we started to think about three uh types of what we were considering as non-target sounds at the time so anthropophony these human related sounds uh, geophony heavy wind and rain and these stridulating insects, whether they're cicadas during the day or um, cricket choruses at night. Um, uh, and we conducted um, what, what we called an oral inventory. So we manu I manually went through, um, during uh, lockdown, I think this was, I manually went through about 14,000 minutes of recordings. So um, yeah, I guess if I wasn't gonna go insane from being stuck inside anyway, this was gonna push me over the edge. Um, and I counted uh, the number of uh, species in these recordings uh, manually. So I, I, I went through these recordings. I said, okay, well, we can look at the spectrogram and listen to the uh, uh, recordings to, to count the number of different species and mark also the presence or absence of these three potentially confounding um, uh, background noises or non-target sounds, I should say. They're not always in the background. They're often very much in the fore foreground. Um, and so we marked the, the presence or absence of those. And then, then what we did was measure the relationship between uh, various popular uh, acoustic indices and the uh, number of species in the soundscape. So we say, what's this? Uh, how well do these acoustic indices predict uh, species richness in the presence versus the absence of these three disruptive sounds? And so then um, we, uh, we looked at this difference between the performance, we're calling this the performance of the indices, uh, which is their ability to reflect um, uh, species richness uh, in the presence or absence of these sounds, and say, what, well, what, how does that performance change with these different sounds? 
And so looking at different uh, acoustic indices on the y-axis here, um, we just read this as a, a, a standardized effect size, basically. So here the uh, sensitivity value is, is here. So um, uh, where you have uh, things further to the right, uh, they tend to be uh, the index is more adversely affected by uh, this particular sonic condition, whether it's human sounds, uh, geophony, or these, these insects. And so things that are further away from that line, there's a larger uh, change in the um, uh, performance of these indices. So the uh, I think it was the slope of the relationship between um, species richness and acoustic index values we looked at. And so a larger value would be a larger dampening of that slope uh, uh, under this sonic condition. And in the opposite, in a few cases, we also saw actually an increase uh, in that slope value. So the in the presence of the this sound, there might uh, be a, a stronger relationship with um, uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, species richness. And so um, we saw a, a big difference in, in various different indices, but most generally performed worse under these challenging sonic conditions, but particularly cicadas uh, were almost always uh, a problem when trying to get uh, species richness values, uh, uh, when trying to use these uh, indices as proxies for species richness. So these ch challenging sonic conditions reduced the interpretability of these acoustic indices. but um, we wrote this paper and, and we we very much didn't mean this as a critique of the indices at, at all. In fact, we we tried to provide some um, kind of what I hope are, are vaguely useful guidelines for when to use these uh, indices and when they might actually tell us useful things. Uh, and actually, the fact that they they often do perform quite well is 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 also very interesting. So uh, yeah, this wasn't meant to be a, a critique of the indices necessarily, but just saying that with careful and targeted use, we can still get some really uh, uh, useful um, proxies for biodiversity out of these acoustic indices. Um, and so now I, I want to highlight that, so um, acoustic monitoring is is really useful tool for conservation and management and is is very well applied for this now. Uh, in a range of systems across the world, but as you've you've probably already um, uh, guessed from from my talk, I'm I'm really a kind of fundamental ecological questions kind of guy, uh, and so um, for me, I'm really interested in using these these high resolution uh, acoustic monitoring time series to think about things like disturbance and stability, which has not been done all that much before. And so this year, uh, uh, quite recently, we published a review about the advantages and challenges of using uh, acoustic monitoring for um, fundamental research, including stability research. And it was a, a really fantastic team of people. I really, really enjoyed writing this paper with them. It was a, a, a real de delight to work with these people. Um, uh, and so, um, yeah, uh, uh, I should highlight um, Zuzana Burivalova put this uh, figure together. Um, uh, which I, I, I really love as a, a kind of instructional uh, aid. It really clearly kind of highlights some of the advantages of working with, with these acoustic data sets, like being able to capture multiple taxonomic groups and thinking about temporal and, and spatial scale and this kind of stuff, uh, as well as some of the challenges, like um, and practical challenges to do with um, power and storage and, and uh, also things like sound propagation and um, uh, uh, and uh, a variation in species um, detectability. Um, and so to, to shift back a little bit, um, uh, when we think about urban areas, animals and soundscapes can be affected uh, both by human land use, that is our, our presence in the landscape, and also by um, noise pollution, that is our activity, what we're doing. And so usually it's uh, entirely impossible to separate those two um, factors in urban soundscapes. Um, so how can we separate noise pollution from human land use? Well, um, I I'm going to take a step away from Japan for a moment, and we're going to uh, rewind a little bit to um, 2020, a year I'm sure many of us are trying to forget. Um, and, uh, and we're going to stop by my, my hometown in Nottingham uh, in the UK, uh, so this is the suburb of, of Woodthorpe, where I grew up. And um, so, of course, in 2020, this was the year that the UK, along with the rest of the world, went into um, 
these lockdowns to combat the spread of, of, of the coronavirus, COVID-19. And so the, the UK did these fairly short bursts of lockdown. So we were all stuck inside and every day kind of felt the same. Um, but for um, for maybe for soundscapes on the outside uh, uh, of, of, our, of our homes where we were mostly spending our time, uh, there, there was actually a, a, a potentially a, a, a big change to certainly to the human activity. And so um, people have, or there's plenty of, of papers came out um, demonstrating that we can use these lockdowns as a natural experiment to ask what's the effect of human activity and, and noise pollution on soundscapes. So I did a, a very small scale uh, study using a single audio moth, um, uh, which is, um, yeah, one of these um, handheld uh, recording devices from made from a Raspberry Pi. I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with them. Um, uh, and I recorded for, for one minute out of every 10 minutes uh, during uh, the, the uh, COVID-19 lockdown when human activity was restricted by law. And then uh, a little bit afterwards when the UK had eased restrictions somewhat and um, uh, these restrictions were, were lifted. Uh, and so these clocks are very similar to the bird song clocks that I showed you um, earlier. So again, we've got kind of uh, dates coming out from the middle and uh, uh, the 24 hour clock, midnight at the top, midday at the bottom. Um, and so on the top here, we're gonna have um, uh, during the lockdown, during the, the COVID lockdowns, and on the bottom after the lockdowns had been uh, 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 eased and people were kind of going about there. I'm not gonna say it was business as usual because in kind of October-ish of 2020, it, it wasn't yet business as usual, but um, um, more so than, than during uh, uh, summer of that year anyway. And so, uh, so the, first of all, this is the anthropophony um, uh, component of, of NDSI. So we see the brighter colors on the bottom here, uh, suggesting that maybe more human noise after the, the lockdown ended. So people returning to the, to the soundscape there. Um, uh, and uh, this is now um, biophony. So the opposites, the, the, the biological um, frequencies, the, the frequencies of sound that are supposedly correspond to biological signals. Uh, and so we see um, here the brighter colors on the top. We, we tend to see a, a darker colors on the bottom here, which is, is suggesting maybe we're seeing less biophony after the lockdown has ended. And so um, when we uh, kind of do the stats on this, these are also standardized effect sizes. So uh, values further away from um, zero here. So uh, uh, on the top above zero is, is higher during lockdown, on the bottom is lower during lockdown. So we did indeed see uh, that there was less uh, noise pollution. Uh, so was anthropophony was um, significantly lower and biophony was actually higher uh, during this lockdown when all the people were uh, shut inside. And uh, when with, well, I also measured the, um, the uh, variability of these uh, uh, time series. So not just the values of um, NDSI and biophony and anthropophony, but also how much that uh, biophony, for instance, is varying through time. So coming back to this stability angle uh, that I introduced at the beginning. And um, uh, I found that, uh, uh, yeah, during the lockdowns, regardless of um, which aspect of the, the soundscape we were thinking about, whether it was biophony or anthropophony, these uh, soundscapes were less variable. So that's when there were not humans in the soundscape, uh, these soundscapes were generally more consistent. So soundscapes tend to be more variable in this case uh, when human activity is higher. But remember, this is just one very, very small scale study um, uh, just in uh, an opportunistic study in a, a front garden during a, a lockdown. Uh, and so we we really need to be thinking um, uh, larger scale to to try and uh, see if this these kinds of patterns are more generalizable. And so there are people um, much smarter than I uh, interested in this kind of thing uh, uh, and and trying to tackle these questions on a much larger scale. So I'm sure many of you have heard of the Silent Cities project that are a really uh, awesome team of people set up during the the lockdown uh, to do exactly this kind of stuff. So people with these acoustic monitors that maybe um, either already had them out in, in field sites or were um, just sitting around and they couldn't go into the field. So maybe instead deploying them in, in as somewhere that was local to them. Uh, and again, aiming to ask 
broad scale general questions about the impact of these lockdowns on soundscapes around the world. And so I'm pleased to have contributed, contributed just a, a tiny, tiny amount to the project. And I'm looking forward to seeing it develop so that we can ask kind of global scale questions about disturbance and human impact and noise pollution. So um, uh, coming back to Okinawa, but thinking still about disturbance, um, uh, I'm going to give you one uh, final example of soundscape disturbance, and we're going to rewind even further beyond 2020 back to um, 2018. Um, so this is kind of August to November. This was autumn in, in 2018 here in Okinawa. And uh, this was uh, one of the heaviest hitting uh, typhoon seasons to uh, to uh, hit uh, Japan for certainly uh, the past a few years, certainly since we've had the acoustic monitors set up in 2017. These are to date the largest typhoons we've ever seen here. Um, uh, and that's um, not really all that surprising that these are quite, quite, um, quite devastating typhoons and they're fairly recent because climate change is making typhoons worse. Uh, they're getting more intense. Uh, they're uh, uh, being formed with uh, higher frequency more often. Uh, and they tend to also last uh, longer, and they the the energy of these typhoons is is kind of dissipated further inland. So they're making it further inland uh, onto continental uh, uh, land as well. Um, but as you can you can probably see, so this is uh, this is Okinawa here. Um, so we we really did get um, uh, really whomped by this typhoon. Uh, so this is uh, this is the main uh, Okinawa's pretty much just got one main road that runs down the, the east side of the island. Uh, and these are like cars up to their, like well over their wheel arches here, uh, um, uh, trying to move down this main road. And this is, you know, like a three lane road. It's like a, a big, like main highway. Um, uh, so anyway, this is uh, 2018. So we had these two typhoons that hit Okinawa in short uh, succession. So we had uh, Typhoon Trami and uh, Typhoon uh, Kong Ray. So Trami hit as a, a super typhoon and Kong Ray hit as a, a subtropical uh, cyclone shortly afterwards. Um, and so we see that, so we had these tracks. So this is a, a pretty standard um, kind of track for, for these subtropical uh, typhoons in the, uh, uh, in the area. They kind of form down here in, in the Southeast and they, they kind of come up past Okinawa here and then circle back round up, up to the northeast. Uh, and so his uh, kind of blown up part of his Okinawa. And so they both they both hit and they were both large enough that they hit the, the island very, very uniformly. Um, so every site was kind of um, uh, impacted uh, with the same amount of, of force because uh, Okinawa really is a fairly small island. And so using uh, acoustic indices, we can detect uh, the signal of typhoons in the soundscapes. So we can see the effects of these big typhoons. So this is just a summary of the average volume over time. And unsurprisingly, the, the heavy wind and rain of typhoons is really loud. And so we can see very clearly here when these typhoons hit, just from the, the volume that these uh, recorders picking up. If you don't want to be listening to those uh, recordings because they just like absolutely max out with kind of wind. Um, and so because we have this uh, land development gradient in Okinawa as well, we can also ask how does, uh, potentially does uh, Okinawa's uh, land use make a difference? Do, do all habitats respond similarly to these typhoons or is there a difference in how different habitats uh, are responding? And so I'm gonna start with this um, early figure that I made um, uh, uh, during my PhD. I think it must've been um, shortly after the typhoons hit, we kind of mocked this up because we were interested. And so this was just one species at one site. And this was really what spawned this project. We saw uh, potentially a, a, a strong drop off after this first typhoon in the number of detections of this uh, crow species. This is the large billed crow uh, at this, this one field site. And so we wondered, well, how, how general is this pattern? Are we seeing this at other field sites as well? And so what does this mean for um, stability more broadly? And so recently we um, formalized this analysis using uh, Bayesian models of, of change in species detections. Uh, so uh, uh, these also read a little bit like standardized effect size. So these are posterior draws from the, the Bayesian uh, analysis. So anything that is gray and to the left of this kind of um, dotted line that you'll see down here, 
um, is uh, uh, represents a decrease in the number of detections after the typhoons. And anything to the right in blue in, uh, represents an increase in the number of detections. And uh, these values, if they're not overlapping this, uh, this kind of dashed line, are uh, kind of equivalent to something being significant. Uh, but note that because this is a Bayesian framework, we're not really using these kind of frequentist p-values. Um, but anyway, so we we trained these, we again trained these Kaleidoscope Pro recognizers on three different target species. Um, so we had the the um, uh, Corvus macrorhynchus, the the uh, large-billed crow. We also had um, Heronis diphone, sometimes Setia diphone, the uh, Japanese bush warbler, and um, the Ryukyu scops owl, which is uh, Otis elegans. And so we expected that the crow is is generally it's a it's a generalist. It's also adapted to urban areas. We thought it might be a fairly resistant to these typhoons, whereas maybe these uh, these bush warblers tend to be a little bit more specialist. And then the uh, owls again are, are entirely forest specialists nesting only in kind of cavities of these uh, mature trees. So we expected these to be uh, sequentially more impacted by the typhoons as we go to the right. Uh, and so when we look at the, the results, as expected, the crow wasn't really that affected across all these different field sites that we looked at. Um, but interestingly, neither was the um, owl. And we don't really know why that is. And, and I think um, anybody with um, uh, owl uh, interests or, or maybe some uh, more knowledge of owls than I have might be able to offer some ideas, but uh, we wondered if it might be something to do with cavity nesting or something. But um, uh, on the other hand, these uh, these bush warblers we really were fairly um, uh, consistently negatively impacted by these uh, typhoons. So this is when we're comparing before and after the typhoons, we are seeing that there's a a drop in the number of detections of these bush warblers after the typhoons in almost all of our field sites. Um, and so uh, again, remembering, you know, we can't say for sure 100% this is mortality. We don't know that these are, um, uh, you know, uh, it's a decline in population abundance necessarily or, or density, uh, but it could, you know, it could be um, behavioral change. It could be um, uh, uh, emigration or, or movement to somewhere else, but we're certainly not then detecting those same, uh, you know, we're not seeing like a, a shift of everything into the forest or anything like that, uh, or we would see an increase in 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 the, the kind of north. So, um, yeah, it, it's an interesting pattern and, and, and we weren't just interested in, um, in the kind of change in vocalizations, but also these different dimensions of stability. We also measured uh, resistance and resilience, but um, the results weren't all that interesting, so I'm not going to show them here. Uh, but I will show you one for uh, temporal variability. So again, thinking about how consistent these vocalizations are of these species through time. And so this is total detection. So when we put all of our species together, uh, we see that um, the the uh, after the typhoons, these um, there was a, a a large increase in the variability. That is these uh, soundscapes, these um, uh, species detections were less stable after the typhoons. Uh, so uh, species were more um, uh, variable in their uh, vocalizations through time. And so this could be some, uh, that's often attributed to things like population thinning. Uh, again, we can't say for sure because it's all observational uh, acoustic data, but that's, that's one hypothesis anyway. So that's uh, uh, an aspect of stability. And then just to kind of finish up, uh, I'm going to show you uh, some uh, interesting results about spatial variability. So this comes to this actually links very nicely with some work that I'm uh, doing, uh, not with acoustics on something called response diversity. So this is the idea that um, we can look at the different response uh, pathways for different uh, species or different sites. And then we can look at the, the diversity of those uh, responses uh, in time or space. Uh, uh, and try and summarize uh, that and see how that links to different aspects of stability. And so here we're measuring uh, what's called spatial variability. So just like we measured um, the coefficient of variation over time, here what we're doing is we're taking values of uh, an acoustic index and we're looking at all of those values uh, at the different sites at a given time point. And then we're taking the coefficient of variation, that's the standard deviation over the mean, of all those points at a given time 
And then we're saying that is our value of spatial variability because it's how variable are these different field sites at this time. And so we can do that uh, for all of the field sites. And then we can also break that down into um, when we do some uh, naive clustering of, of the land use, um, uh, it, uh, the, um, the, um, the computer drops out these two very clear clusters of field sites, ones that are uh, generally typified as being uh, forested sites, whereas ones that are developed kind of urban and agricultural sites mainly. And so we also break these down into these two uh, categories and we measure the uh, variability of um, these forested sites and these developed sites separately. And so we do this at each time point. So we do that and we get one time point uh, of spatial variability down here for each of these. And then we do it again at another time point and again and so on. And so just like we have a time series of the original acoustic indices, we then have time series of spatial variability. So this is how does the variability of these acoustic indices uh, change through time? So hopefully you've followed that um, because this is what the results look like. So this is from our uh, paper that is still a, a work in progress. It's on uh, BioArchive as a preprint. We're currently revising it. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so this is a time series of spatial variability, first of biophony across all of these 24 field sites. And you might notice that, so, so these, these are the typhoons here in uh, the dashed lines. Uh, well, so, so the, the typhoons are kind of in the middle, the dashed lines delineate the kind of before and after period. Um, <laughs> and uh, you might notice a kind of general increase. And when we again do the, the stats using these kind of um, effect sizes, when we see uh, non-overlapping uh, confidence intervals here, we see that there is indeed a significant increase in spatial variability of um, biophony after the typhoons. Uh, and then we can break that down, as I said, by the forested uh, sites in green and the developed sites in, in this kind of pinky purple. And we see that before the um, typhoons, there's a, a, a kind of larger um, spatial variability of these of biophony here. And there's also this um, increase in uh, bio in uh, sorry spatial variability after the typhoons. But then when we look at um, the change uh, in the developed habitat, that that increase there wasn't significant. And so. If, if these forests are, uh, are generally more spatially variable and also potentially uh, more so afterwards uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and, and it's kind of increasing after the typhoons, which by the way is the opposite of what we were expecting. We expected typhoons to come in and homogenize the soundscapes because we kind of expected uh, um, uh, everything to all these different field sites to kind of respond similarly to these really big um, uh, disturbances even within the forest. Um, but then we know we saw this kind of um, uh, 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 divergence in in responses, and so that suggests that that these forests have a, a potentially a greater variety of these different response pathways through which uh, they can respond to disturbance. While these developed sites might be less flexible in uh, in their kind of biophony and typhoon responses, so it, it's um, it's by no means a very concrete result, but it's certainly quite interesting. And when we uh, when we break it down, also when we look at anthropophony, so you know we're saying, okay, well that might just be an artifact of 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 the way we calculate um, biophony or whatever. Uh, maybe it's all the acoustic indices that are doing this. But we looked at various others, and uh, and I'm just going to show you anthropophony as an example. And we saw no significant change in uh, the human related aspect of the soundscape uh, in terms of its temporal variability and spatial variability. Sorry. Um, and, and there was no also no difference among these different field sites. And uh, I also really like that it, it's pretty clear that these figures uh, would nicely fit together as well. So with that, I'm, I'm going to wrap up and, and say thank you to all of my really fantastic collaborators and all these various projects, uh, as well as funders from uh, the Canon Foundation in Europe and the Irish Research Council, uh, as well as funding from OIST. Uh, and end with a summary that we, we can use observational acoustic data to answer uh, what I consider to be really interesting fundamental questions in ecology and uh, reveal impacts of global environmental change. And these uh, species detection algorithms and acoustic industries are, are, are very far from perfect, but they can be useful for helping us to understand stability. 
And stability can uh, be affected by human activity and human land use, probably by both. But these results are, are potentially context dependent. And so we need more work like this. And at larger scales, things like the, the Silent Cities project are going to be really informative, I think, in coming years. So I'm going to stop there. I've probably almost gone over my time. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Sam. That was a whirlwind tour. <laughs> I guess that was a pun without even intending it to be. So we've got some questions in the chat. Um, Vijay. Hey, uh, thanks, man. And uh, thank you, Sam, for this uh, really wonderful talk. I really enjoyed listening to all of this, and I'm looking forward to reading your preprint. I... Uh, I had a couple of questions. One is, you know, like uh, just thinking about how bird detections are often seasonal. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you were able to differentiate the effect of typhoon from seasonal variation in vocal activity for these bird species. Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, yeah, so um, short answer is yes. So yes, bird det detections very much are seasonal. Two of the um, uh, species that we see there are, are not, like it's not, like their breeding season or anything like that. So we're unlikely to see a kind of strong seasonal signals in this data because it's only like a kind of two or three months, I think it is, two and a half months. Uh, so it's a fairly short time window still. Um, but we also, I mean, we also de-seasonalized the, the time series using a kind of standardized, uh, a standard kind of moving average detrend thing um, uh, uh, that, that tried to pass out some of these kind of uh, overall seasonal signals. Uh, you can do, of course, there are more complicated ways of doing that using things like wavelets, uh, but we just don't have the this in with this time series, this like uh, short segment. We don't have the kind of periodicity yet to do that. I think if we were looking at the whole kind of five years or so, then we would have enough data now to, to do one of the more advanced kind of seasonal decompositions. But for this small time series, we can't really do that in any meaningful way. It just kind of spits out noise at us. Uh, so it's pretty difficult, but um, when we look at the uh, the signals and in the individual species, you see this uh, this pretty sharp um, drop. Uh, like uh, that, I guess the I didn't put a figure up in the um, slide, but I guess the equivalent would be that figure of just the crow that I showed you, that preliminary figure. Well, you see this really sharp immediately after the typhoons. You see this drop off, and so I guess our, our reasoning for saying that we think this is probably a typhoon effect is. If 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 this were a seasonal effect, I, I don't know if they would drop off quite so quickly as, as they do there in in kind of um, in, in in kind of immediately after the typhoons. It might be a more kind of gradual decline as some you know males continue to sing long after others for whatever reason. Maybe they've you know not successfully mated or whatever. So um, yeah, that that kind of fairly sharp drop off that we see in a lot of uh, in the the, a lot of the the time series there, I think, is is our reasoning for thinking it's most likely not a seasonal effect. But yeah, it's a good question. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I'll hold off on my other question. If other qu others have other questions, I can come back to it later. Yeah. Well, I see that Klaus is bringing up one of my favorite open questions um regarding animals responding or um anticipating earthquake events mm. and so is that um something that you're that's on your radar with this um transect that you've got set up across okinawa yeah it's not something i've really thought about in much detail this kind of predictive uh kind of using behavior to predict disturbance uh, uh and kind of responses afterwards but it's really interesting um and yeah there's definitely a lot that can be done there uh, and yeah as you say particularly along the um the disturbance gradient as well um uh, something that we do see is um a, a lot of the time so so we have a lot of so okinawa has um the the us military base here is uh the largest um military uh, base outside of of uh, the continental United States, and so um, we have a very very strong um, uh, uh, military presence, and that comes with a lot of uh, very loud um, military aircraft. And so what we do see quite a lot is in um, particularly in the north, in the kind of more 
I hesitate to use the word pristine because I don't know if there's really any way of pristine anymore, but um, the, the forests uh, in the north of Okinawa, we do see that uh, a lot of species um, start kind of um, their, almost their kind of warning calls and their kind of um, like vocalizations to kind of respond to disturbance before we hear these military aircraft and then we hear them in the recordings and then we we see them after. So, so that, I mean, that's a very small scale uh, example, but uh, we do fairly consistently see them kind of start to panic and then we hear the, the thing and then they, they continue uh, signaling afterwards as well. So yeah, it's a really interesting question. I'd love to know more about that kind of stuff. And of course, yeah, we're, it's not just birds. So there's probably all kinds of other uh, animals that we can use to think specifically about earthquakes as well. So yeah, really, really great question. Have you kept up this transect and will you be um, able to answer like if these um, different locations have recovered back to pre-typhoon levels or what that trajectory looks like in the longer term? Yeah, uh, a, a next step for me, I think, is to do a kind of, um, what year are we in now? A kind of two, two and three years later. Oh, wait, no, 2018 is more like five years later. Um, uh, kind of, yeah, like looking at like one year later, two years later, so on, what's the soundscape look like? And But the, pro the, the problem with that is we also get more, like we get typhoons every year. And so it's very hard to say like what is, like when you have um, uh, complete recovery, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Particularly when you've got continuous disturbance in a system like this in a fairly predictable way every year. Uh, and so, yeah, it's it's a really interesting question. I'd love to know that. Uh, and so to, to come to your, your first point about continuous recording, yes, we will be continuing the, um, acoustic recording here on this um, schedule for as long as we can. Um, right now, the funding is still there, so we, I hope that it, it continues to to be. Um, and so, yeah, we'll we'll also be able to answer hopefully longer term questions as well about things like climate change. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I wonder, you know, if anybody else on this call has data from that includes some sort of large disturbance. You know, maybe there's different types of responses in areas with like yearly or um, higher disturbance regimes versus places where it's not as common. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's this this whole thing that I'm, yeah, there's there's a whole subfield that are on like ecological memory. Uh, it's often called this I idea of, yeah, recurrent disturbance priming uh, systems against future impacts. Uh, and so, yeah, maybe if you're if you hit something with a typhoon, for example, if it's then hit with another typhoon, maybe it's maybe the species that are left over from the previous typhoon, if things have been killed or whatever, maybe you're you've got your kind of hardy species left. And so maybe you're then more resilient in future or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe you've you've kind of hit them with one. And then if you've not fully recovered, you hit them with another. And then maybe the the, the impacts are even worse. So, yeah, that's something I'm really, really interested in, but don't yet have the data for. So actually, yeah, if anybody here does have that kind of data and would be interested in some kind of synthesis or something, that'd be really, really cool to do. So yeah, do let me know. Yeah, so if anyone has similar questions or data sets, please reach out to Sam. Um, he's also extended, um, a, I would say, a pretty open invitation if anyone is going to IBAC um, and wants to check out Okinawa. And um, Yeah, absolutely. So... Well, thanks, Sam, for for joining with us today and just a really great talk. Um, Thank you so much. Your work is is super interesting and um, looking forward to see how, I don't know, this study system progresses, different questions you explore. And uh, so big thanks to you. For Thank staying. you very much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. All right, well, we'll see everybody in two weeks' time. We've got Alice Eldridge as part of the UK May take over on Bioacoustics. That'll be May 30th. And see y'all soon. Thanks for coming out.